Chinese votive sword found in Georgia of the United States suggests pre-Columbian Chinese travel to North America, that is, before Christopher Columbus. An avocational surface collector discovered a partially exposed Chinese votive sword behind roots on an eroded bank of a small stream in Georgia in July 2014. The 30 centimeter relic is probably a one-of-a-kind find in North America and adds to the increasing list of seemingly out-of-place Chinese artifacts indicating Chinese transit to North America during the pre-Columbian period. The magnific magnificent sword has been identified as being made of lizardite and has surface traits that indicate it's quite ancient. Further testing will hopefully establish a type of stone and pinpoint the source as lizardite deposits exist in both the eastern and western hemispheres. The answers to the when, who, and how questions are still unknown. An effort to employ thermoluminescent testing protocols to identify when the soil at the extraction location was last exposed to sunlight was hindered since it was discovered that the soil had been disturbed. There's still a tiny part of an unknown strand stranded substance clinging to the blade that may be acceptable for radiocarbon dating as well as select sections of surface secretions that may yield useful information. And the sword has Chinese symbology. The various symbols and the form of the sword, both of which are found on jade artifacts from the Xia period, that's 2070 to 1060 BC, 1600 BC, the Shang Dynasty, 1600 to 1046 BC. The Zhu Dynasties are less ambiguous, 1046 to 256 BC. The Shang Dynasty is represented by the dragon motif spanning a section of the top blade that is the feathered crown. So that's 1600 BC. The hideous Tao Tai face mask on the sword guard and handle initially occurs during the Liangzhu civilization, that's 3400 BC to 2250 BC, although it's not most typically discovered during the Shang and Zhu periods. Personal chat with Liu Ziu uh, Liang Li, PhD, soon to be published work. The existence of the Shang period diagnostics, as well as the Tao Ti resemblance to images of the Mesoamerican Olmec uh, Jagger, Jaguar have indications as to when the sword was manufactured and a rough time range for when it may have arrived in Georgia of the United States. The Chinese Olmec Connection For nearly a century, scholars have debated the similarities between Chinese and Olmec mythology and iconography. Perhaps it has, it's no accident that the Olmec civilization debuts about 1500 BC at the start of the Shang Dynasty and that the first recorded history of China begins. It marked the beginning of the Bronze Age, which resulted in beautiful bronze works of art, bronze chariots and weaponry. During this period, the earliest Chinese characters appeared along with large irrigation systems and other public works projects, all of which indicate a sophisticated and evolved society. It was also a moment in Chinese culture when jade was more precious than gold and the Olmec aristocracy who possessed jade mines in what is now Honduras and Guatemala felt the same way. It's possible that the Olmec during the middle formative period 900 to 300 BC conquered the problems of shaping and drilling jade, stone so hard that it cannot be handled with steel tools into little decorative and votive pieces with abrasive materials. The parallels between Chinese and Olmec art are striking, and an excellent comparison can be found in art and ritual in early Chinese and Mesoamerican cultures, Santiago Gonzalez Villagos 2009 said. Now the potential introduction of Chinese conceptions of rulership and stratification, as well as their religion and symbols impacted the Olmec and succeeding Mesoamerican tribes. It was a scene that would be replicated in the 16th century when Spanish friars waded ashore with the Christian cross.
How did the sword get to Georgia? And these are some possibilities. These new Almic cultural traits began to spread over the region from 900 BC. There is substantial evidence that they served as a basis for their contemporaneous and future cultural groups, such as the Maya. The essential beliefs of the Olmecs lasted throughout the 16th century conquering era, however, adapted by different cultures to satisfy local requirements and with modifications over time. Surprisingly, some of these old principles, such as maize cultivation, are being practiced today by certain Mesoamerican indigenous communities. This spread is thought to have occurred as a result of the, of the Olmec land and coastal marine trade networks delivering basic and exotic trade products. A fascinating aspect of this cultural phenomenon and why it's highlighted is that it, began, it begins approximately 900 BC when the Olmec began manufacturing jade ceremonial artifacts as previously stated. The dispersion of flat and cylindrical printed seals, a technology that first occurred in the Mesoamerican artifact record with the Olmec, is an illustration of the geographic scope of this cultural diffusion. Printing seals first emerged in China during the Shang Dynasty. Olmec tradition spread north. By 800 BC, seals were used in northern Southern America, South America, some 1,700 miles south of the Olmec heartland, and an equivalent distance north of the Adena culture, 800 BC in North America's upper Ohio River Valley. Not only did printing technology make its way to Ohio, but so did Olmec art. This author discovered stylistic counterparts of the distinctive center vertical piece depicting the world tree in the Lake Chalco region south of modern Mexico City and at Veracruz on the Gulf Coast in an unpublished study endeavored on the Adena tablet pictured. Now, the presence of seals at the start of the transformative mound building Adena civilization, together with other evidence too, new, too numerous to describe in this uh, little essay, suggests that an influential Mesoamerican group reached the region and altered the cultural destiny of the local people. Now, returning to Georgia, in 1685, Charles de Rochefort and his chronicles regarding the, Ap the Apalachites, who occupied the lands of southeastern America in the 17th century, writes, these Apalachites boats that they had propagated certain colonies a great way into Mexico, and they show to this day a great road by land by which they affirm that their forces marched into those parts. When they arrived, the inhabitants of the country gave them the name Tlat Tuichi, which means mountaineers or highlanders. These people, the Apalachites, the Appalachians that is, have a communication with the sea of the great Gulf of Mexico or New Spain by means of a river, says Rushford. The Spaniards have called this river Rio del Espirito Santo, that is the Mississippi River. Now, while Rushford's findings date from after the conquest period, they emphasize the geographical aspect that is sometimes disregarded or underestimated North American history, the many civilizations that occupied what is now Georgia, the United States, and other states bordering the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the Caribbean islands, Mexico, and South America, were part of a circum-Caribbean zone where everyone knew their neighbors. As a result, it's reasonable to conclude that this is why ball courts and rubber balls may be found in both mainland Mesoamerica and the Caribbean islands. Furthermore, the Olmec and Maya possessed a fleet of enormous ocean-going canoes cruising the Gulf region's coastal waterways, as well as the logistic structures to serve the basic necessities of big metropolitan centers with population densities comparable to today's major cities. For example, salt, a basic essential for existence in the tropics, was carried in tens of thousands of tons per month from salt producing facilities in the Yucatan to well-known river ports ranging from the Honduran Mosquito Coast to Tampico, Mexico. Aside from being a wet and dangerous experience in heavy waves off the Mosquito Coast with no life preservers, I can confirm from repeated journeys that the dugout log design works quite well. 
with the exception of Yamaha outboard motors, these vessels, which have not altered in manufacturing or design since the Maya, continue to deliver tons of st stacked 50-gallon drums of fuel, food, and people into the Hondura interior. The magnificent Tian Taino civilization, which migrated from Venezuela approximately 400 BC to the Caribs, were usually equally proficient in navigating the seas of the Gulf of Mexico and the Greater Antilles. Christopher Columbus records multiple entries in this log of enormous Taino boats packed with trade goods and passengers ranging in length from 40 to 79 feet. More importantly, his log entries show that the Taino were aware of the Calusa in Florida and the Maya in the Yucatan. All of this suggests that the cultures of the Circum-Caribbean region, even in more ancient times, were linked by water and land routes, which provides a probable explanation of how the sword and two Olmec-style pendants arrived in Georgia. So, were the Chinese in Georgia? The item itself is part of the solution. You have to wonder why someone would carry a votive sword, which is defined as an object expressing a religious vow, wish, or desire, offered or performed as an expression of thanks or devotion to God, if they were not Chinese. Second, the sword is not the only identifying Chinese artifact discovered there. Dr. Li, a Chinese expert, said that two more ancient Chinese relics were recently discovered within a two-hour drive of the sword location. He plans to include these items in a future publication, and there have also been a surprising amount of additional Chinese artifacts, rock art, calligraphy, and symbols discovered in Southern America. Unfortunately, there never appears to be enough facts to achieve a defin definitive, non-debatable conclusion that everyone can agree on when it comes to historical and archaeological matters. So at this time, the question, were the Chinese in Georgia, may only be answered yes when there is sufficient proof to exceed individual's threshold of believability. Approximately 90 years ago, a final thought, before Columbus first sailed into, uh, uh, 90 years before Columbus sailed into the Caribbean seas, the Ming Chinese sent flotillas headed by Admiral Zheng He on several expeditions to the region surrounding the Indian Ocean to obtain exotic commodities and minerals. The Admiral's first expedition consisted of approximately 185 vessels, 62 or 63 Baoshan or treasure ships were constructed for the first expedition, 440 feet long to 538 feet long by 210 feet wide, so they were huge as you can understand, four decks, nine masts, displacing an estimated 20 to 30,000 tons, approximately a third to a half the displacement of a current large aircraft carrier. Mashuan or horseships, 340 feet long by 138 wide, eight masts carrying horses, timber for repairs and tribute goods, Lianchuan or grain ships, 257 feet long by 115 feet wide, seven masts carrying grain for crew and soldiers, Zhuochuan or troop ships, 220 feet long by 84 feet wide, six masts, Shan Chuan warships, 165 feet long, five masts, 27 to 28,000 estimated sailors, soldiers, translators, and crew members. Obviously, they would have gotten there, even to Mexico, Yucatan, and South America, and North America, and even, yes, Georgia. This is by MRU. Please leave your comments and thank you for your support. I really support my Patreon account. The daily posts are five videos daily and they are totally different from what I have on my YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support and that you find all my content so interesting. You'll find the Patreon account details in the description box below.